Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Stephen to you today. I know him from decades ago in Stellenbosch. That's where he grew up, but he was a Rondebosch boy um, and is now in Pretoria working to try and help our education become world class as we should be able to striving for. Stephen currently is the Director of Research, Monitoring and Evaluation in the South African Department of Basic Education. So it's a very important job there. Since 2007, he has been doing research on education in South Africa and the surrounding region, with a focus on the links between education and economic development. He has been a principal investigator on several large-scale evaluations, including the early grade reading study. I think that's the most important one. His academic work focuses on impact evaluation of education, interventions, measuring educational performance and equity in educational outcomes. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Stellenbosch. Thank you, Stephen, for coming to share your experience and expertise with us. We look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much for having me and, and good morning to all. These are the things I'm planning on talking through. I'm planning on talking a little bit about the shape and size of basic education in South Africa by way of context, just things like how many schools and children we have. I'm going to look at long-term trends in education. I think. If, you, if you're just reading the media, one might get the impression that like, things are just falling apart. And so it, it can be quite useful to take a very long-term view of, of things and look at how measures of, of quality in the system have been changing over time. That will lead us into a few side eddies around little things like the debates that we always see in January about the metric results. You might know about people's concerns about a 30% pass mark and people always say, well, yes, the pass rate was 75% or whatever it was in a year, but what about the real metric pass rate? How many people actually even reach metric? So we'll talk a bit about that. And we'll try to take a step back and look at the role of, of our education system in the country's economic development as well um, and see the crucial role that it plays, although it also has, its, has limits in the role it can play. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how can we actually improve things. And lastly, you might be interested to see some of what we've been doing from a research monitoring evaluation point of view in terms of looking at the impact of the pandemic on our school system. Okay, so that's where we're going. So what is the size and shape of, of, our, of our sector that we're working with? I sit in the National Department of Basic Education, but the system is quite decentralized as with other aspects of service delivery and in terms of our overall constitution, we have nine provinces and provincial education departments actually play a very important role. The majority of budgets go through them. Teachers are, are hired and supervised through the provincial departments. So the role of the national department is more about setting policy and then monitoring the implementation of that policy. We've also got education districts. At the moment, there are 75 of them. And within districts, you have even smaller support units like circuit officers, and they provide support more directly to schools through things like subject advisors and, and monitoring. Altogether, we have a little bit over 25,000 schools. The strong majority of those are public schools. It's only a fairly small percentage a number of, the, of schools that are independent schools. We have just over 2,000 registered independent schools, and there may be some unregistered uh, and illegal schools operating as well. Maybe worth saying that with independent schools, not all independent schools are, are your sort of high-end, very high-fee elite schools that one might think of. You actually do get quite a lot of independent schools serving medium to poorish communities as well. Let's move on from the shape and size that shows some more of the stats. We've got just over 13,000 children enrolled in, in the school system. Again, the majority of them, like 95% of them are in public schools. And we've got over 400,000 teachers across a number of languages. 
Okay, so how is the system performing? And I thought let's take a long-term view of it. A lot of the headlines are quite sensational. Sometimes even people will assert that education is, is even worse than it was under apartheid in the past. Even Mampele Rampele said, said that a while back. This is just an extract from a, from a Mail and Guardian article of a few years ago where she lashed out at the 30% pass benchmark and saying, you know, things like math literacy is worse than what was, what, what was offered under Bantu education. So we, we do sometimes have, have a lot of criticism going on. But what is the long-term view of things objectively? The first thing to recognize is that access to schooling, so simply being able to participate in school, has increased dramatically in the long term. So this graph is from 2007 data that was collected, and it presents a historical view because it shows the percentage of people with seven years or more of education, so kind of percentage who complete primary school, roughly speaking, by race group, by year of birth. On the left of the graph, you see older generations, people are born in 1910s, 20s, 30s. And there you see that for the older generations who would have had access to schooling in previous generations, there's, there were really big gaps between the race groups. So you're already in the 20s and 30s, you know, almost all white people in South Africa completed seven years of education. But that was far from the case for the other race groups. For black people, it's really only people who were born since the 60s, in, in which group at least half of them completed primary school. And we see that for the most recent cohorts, those born since the 80s and 90s, it's now approaching that situation where almost all even black and colored people complete primary school level education. So it's firstly important to understand that when we're comparing to say how things were perhaps under apartheid, that you're looking at a situation where a lot of people were not even included at all in the school system. If you look at the kind of investment that was made just financially into the different race groups in, in the past, it was obviously hugely unequal, it was quite well known. Whereas uh, in the 1970s, about 35 Rand was spent per capita of the white population, that was only like two Rand per capita of the African population. So for many generations here, as you can see, you know, vastly different investment into our human capital, which speaks to, to the backlogs and, and issues that and the extent of the challenge that's been faced in the last 25 years or so. If we look at some of the outputs of the system in terms of school leaving or senior certificate or matric passes, we see these are just the numbers over time. In the past, you know, you can see like in the 70s, where we had about 35,000 white people every year completing high school, doing, getting their matric. The equivalent amongst the other population groups was much, much lower, only a couple of thousand. Over time, this shows, this shows more recent trends. Okay, it doesn't break it down by race, but here's the, the situation in the 70s, where you see altogether about 43,000 matric passes. That consistently increased by 1990, it was about 191,000. So already a lot of progress towards the end of, of apartheid. And then that's continued since in terms of the overall numbers. Whereas about 90% of these 43,000 in 1970 were white people, only about 10% of the 440,000 who passed matric last year were white people. So access has changed dramatically in the first place before we even look at sort of the, the quality of, of learning outcomes. Um, more recently, we, we still have seen improvements in, in specific areas of access. One area where there's been quite a lot of improvement has been in access to early learning opportunities. So if we just look at through household survey data, the percentages of five-year-olds and six-year-olds that are attending some kind of education institution, this could be grade R, it could be a creche, could even be grade one in the case of six-year-olds. Sorry, that jumped ahead. We see quite strong increases since even as recent as 2002. So if you look at five-year-olds, that blue line, in 2002, about 40% of five-year-olds were attending some kind of educational institution, and that is now almost 90%. That's quite a dramatic shift in just what five-year-olds are doing and their exposure to education. So we've seen improved access over time. 
pretty consistently. If we look at completion rates at the grade nine level by race group, we see, especially for the African colored population, we see that's increased from about 70% of people of those groups completing grade nine in 2002 to now it is a roughly 90% of even African and colored people completing grade nine. So that's quite a big increase just in the last nearly 20 years. And if we look at completion of grade 12 as a percentage of the population, we, earlier we looked at some absolute numbers, but if we look at it as a percentage, uh, even in the last nearly 20 years, there have been further increases, in particular for the black and colored population going from under 40% in 2002 to over 50%, we're in the sort of mid 50s now of the entire population. So still big inequalities, as you can see, whereas it's, it's between 80 and 90% of white and Indian people who are youths who complete grade 12 now, it's still not even 60% amongst African and colored people. So still big inequalities, but the trends are all positive, at least in terms of access and completion of schooling. All right, if we look at how this has led to changes at the university level, this shows the numbers of graduations or graduates every year since 1986 by race group. And while in 1986, you can see that by far most of university graduates were white by 2012, and even this is historical, so it's not even accounting for the last nine years or so. By 2012, the picture is very different, and we had almost the same numbers of, of white people graduating every year consistently and that's I guess the population is if anything shrinking amongst the white population but big big increases in completing university amongst the black population so I think it's hard to argue based on just access participation completion that things were better in the past but even if the quality for those who were there was maybe better which which I, I will get to next it's difficult to, to say that a system that excludes so many was, was a good one. All right, so then quality indicators. We measure quality quite objectively, and we participate in several international surveys where you do things like measure a nationally representative sample of children. These samples are usually quite large, like maybe children across like three or 400 schools, testing like a sample of, of like 20 children in each of those schools in a particular grade. Usually it's like grade, say grade nine maths or grade six maths or grade five reading or something like that on a, on a standardized assessment that allows for comparisons across countries and across time. So they do it that sort of the same assessments or the assessments are, are anchored so that comparisons are scientifically possible across time. So we can really measure trends in learning outcomes and we've participated in three of these, these major international assessments. TIMS, PILS, and SACME, those are just acronyms. For instance, TIMS stands for Trends in International Maths and Science Study. What these studies are showing is that we consistently have had low performance since we started measuring, very unequal outcomes. Our performance is usually, it's very low in comparison with European, North American, East Asian countries but it's slightly above average in the region. So compared to other countries in Southern and East Africa, we're sort of a little bit above average. There's one survey called SACMEC, for instance, which tests uh, maths and literacy at the grade six level across 15 Southern and East African education systems. And there we come about seventh out of 15. So it's not, it's not great, but it's not like the worst in the world or something like that. And of course, only, uh, yes, only a certain level of functionality countries would actually even participate. So failed states and many African countries don't, don't even participate in these studies. So for instance, what does this low learning mean in the early grades? For instance, the Pearl study in 2016 found that about 78% of our children reach grade four without learning to read with a kind of a minimum benchmark level of comprehension. So that's obviously massively concerning because if you haven't really learned to read properly by grade four, you are very far behind where you need to be, but also you are unable to really cope with the demands of the curriculum from there on out. So we have also unequal learning outcomes. Some people describe it as almost two systems within one, where you have your maybe 10 
to 15% of schools which are functioning quite well in terms of learning outcomes. These schools are often your historically white schools, but they are quite integrated these days. So when sort of historically white and more affluent schools these days are racially quite diverse, quite integrated, but it's still socioeconomically quite uh, unequal, quite it's largely your sort of African middle class who's in that with more white and colored children. Whereas the sort of historically black schools are still largely black children. So we still have this racial inequality, but especially a socioeconomic inequality. And in those schools, the learning outcomes are still very low. So we have a lot of inequality still to deal with. But what sometimes gets lost in all that bad news is that there have been steady improvements since 2002. The Tim study was the one we've been doing for the longest. We, we did that in 1995, in 1999, in 2002, and there was no improvement across those years from 95 to 2002. But since 2002, with each Tim study, there's been improvements in our average maths and science scores as a country. And this is significant because it's also despite the improvements in access that we've been speaking about. So it would have been a, a possible scenario that as access widens, because it's largely poorer and more previously disadvantaged groups entering the system, you might expect the average quality to go down. But even despite the widening of access, our average quality in terms of maths and science scores at grades like grade six, and grade nine have actually improving. They're still low. And I think this, this speaks to the long, long nature of, of improving education as one component of economic development. But there have been these improvements. So, you know, whether you look at access to school or equity or quality. So let's think about now what role all of this plays now in our economic development. Economic growth is a short term thing. It's like, how, how is your GDP growing from one year to the next? Economic development speaks to the long-term improvement in the economy and in your living standards for the population. So it's things like uh, levels of employment, the quality of your health systems, the quality of your education systems, so, so access to those things. And, and over the long period of time, one, one hopes that all those indicators are improving and that the economic development of the country is improving. And our problem in terms of our economic development as probably we're all aware is we have high levels of social and economic inequality that persists despite a lot of policy interventions and good intentions over the last 25 years we still have massive problems of poverty unemployment inequality it creates a massive threat to our country if people talk about the ticking time bomb even the recent unrest and protests you know regardless of who instigated it and why exactly they happened they exploit the underlying vulnerability of this inequality and of, of a large group of people who feel like they're excluded. And, and education has a, has a role to play in that. The kinds of policies one can do after education are constrained by the unequal education outcomes. So there's only so much that affirmative action policies can do in the labor market if there just aren't enough skills coming through. Social grants are maybe a way to sort of alleviate the, the harsh effects of poverty, but they don't really solve the underlying problem. And so we know that we have very unequal education outcomes in terms of percentages of people completing university and getting the kinds of education that allows them to compete well in the labor market. We also know from research that metric marks strongly predict your final education outcomes. So we've done studies that look at how well people did in metric and we trace them through to university, do they enter university, do you complete university, how well do you do in university, and matric marks are very strong at predicting final education outcomes, which we know predicts labor market outcomes and inequalities. But matric marks in turn are strongly predicted by earlier scores, earlier test scores and things like literacy and numeracy in the earlier grades. And we also know, as I've already discussed, that, that test scores and, and foundational learning in the early grades is very unequal across the country. And so, in my opinion, from the research I've been doing, it looks like for me a really important part of our overall economic development is getting literacy and numeracy right in early grades and reducing the inequalities there. If we don't do that, I feel like all the other stuff is going to be massively hamstrung.
So from my perspective, I think it's worth just bearing in mind that a huge long-term challenge is improving the quality of learning and teaching in the early grades to get those foundational skills right so that people are actually equipped and have opportunities to meaningfully participate and get better education outcomes and hence better economic outcomes later. The problem is it's a long-term challenge. So it's never like the urgent thing for government to fix. It's never like, like a pandemic or a fees must fall campaign or something where there's like an immediate demand for funding or attention. Improving early grade reading and numeracy only has a payoff maybe in 15 or 20 years time, but it really is an important part of our economic development challenge. So then that leads to the next question about how do we actually improve things? How do we get these kinds of quality level improvements which are necessary despite the progress that we've seen? That is the million dollar question. What drives these system level improvements? And I, and I say it's a million dollar question for two reasons, especially because it's quite hard to answer. You might think it's simple. Everyone might have an opinion on what needs to change, but it's not easy from a research point of view to sort of say objectively, this is what's going to improve the overall quality at scale. And it's also a million dollar question because it might take a lot of money to get certain things right. And right now we, we under a lot of fiscal pressure in the country. We don't have a lot of money, especially after the pandemic. Uh, so the government's budget is, is not in a great situation. We also know what doesn't work, what doesn't drive quality improvements in the system. So just paying higher wages on its own does not really lead to better teaching outcomes nor really do formal qualifications. So simply trying to, trying to upgrade everyone's paper qualifications hasn't really been shown to improve the quality that much. To some extent, that doesn't mean that the quality of pre-service training is not important. I think there's still an important role for universities to play in, in training teachers. Uh, new technologies is, is an interesting question. You know, can we expect things like ICT and new ways of teaching using remote methods or like computer assisted learning and adaptive methods, is that going to be a game changer? The jury's still out. Some people are, I think, wildly optimistic. Others are just cynical. I'm probably somewhere in between. I do know that technologies are, are expensive. And I also know that we're struggling to just get internet connectivity to all our schools. So I sort of feel like there isn't a lot of evidence yet to suggest that this is just going to be a game changer. And I think the pandemic has also shown us that the remote learning wasn't a solution for most children. And I'll speak a bit more about the impact of the pandemic shortly. Another quick way of addressing this question about what leads to system level improvements is to look at what actually did lead to the improvements we have seen recently. And I think that's what gets lost is that sometimes people are so concerned about the, the problems we have that we, we could throw away some of the things that actually have improved performance in the last 15 or so years. One of the things that improves performance, which is not something we can immediately address, is, is the improvements in parental education. So it looks like some of the improvements we've seen in, in like the average maths and literacy levels in the last few years are to some extent the fruit of parents with more years of education. So that's kind of like a payoff from the improved access we saw in the 80s and 90s, maybe even the 70s, compared to previous generations of parents. So there might be better support in the homes to education because more parents are literate themselves. But other things that some of the research we've been doing inside and outside of the department point to in terms of the last sort of 10 to 15 years is I think there's been expanded access and use of books in schools. Again, at a very basic level, I think there was a lot of evidence from classroom observation studies, say 10, 20 years ago, showing that children very infrequently interacted with text. The way lessons happened, especially in the early grades, was largely kind of oral based, chorusing back to teachers, singing and chanting back, but not really interacting with text themselves. And despite some problems, maybe because, because of some problems, in especially 2012, you might remember there was a textbook scandal or crisis in Limpopo in particular. I think already at the time and since then, there's been a big rollout of textbook delivery, in particular the DBE workbooks. These are like somewhere like a hybrid between like an exercise book, which is blank, and a textbook, where it's kind of like a textbook and it has content and exercises, but you write in it yourselves. This is now being distributed to all children in the country. So each child has their own, they can interact with it, and teachers seem to use it a lot. 
So there's a lot more use of just text in, in classes. There have been some improvements to the curriculum. You, you've probably heard of outcomes-based education, which was, I think it's widely agreed to have, have failed quite, quite badly. And, and since then, there've been, there've been several kind of rounds of reform and clarifications and, and improvements in, in curriculum statements. And I think the general consensus is that although the, the curriculum will continue to need review, um, then there's a number of critiques that could still be mounted about the curriculum. I think it's better than what it was 15 years ago. Another one which, which I believe was important in some of the improvements we saw in sort of from about 2011 to 2016 or so was that for a while we had something called annual national assessments. These were uh, standardized tests that grades one to six were doing. All children were writing the same test at one point in the year. It wasn't linked to a qualification or anything like that, but and it was quite a blunt instrument, it was critiqued, in particular teacher unions didn't like it. But what it did do was it communicated at the primary school level that learning outcomes are important and that there are certain outcomes that need to be achieved. Because the problem we had, and to some extent we still have, because these national assessments were scrapped in 2015, largely due to union opposition. We had a situation, and to some extent still have a situation, where children keep progressing through the system. So they stay in school, they maybe repeat a grade here and there, but even if they repeat once, they usually stay in the system and progress through to about grade 10 or grade 11. And that's where we see a lot of dropout happening. Because what actually happens is children get to grade 10 and 11, but they are far behind where the curriculum needs them to be. And they've been allowed to get through because there wasn't really like a hard form of assessment and it was just easy to keep promoting people and for them to stay in the system. But by grade 10 and 11, schools and children themselves are starting to look at the matric exam, which is a very hard and objective hurdle to, to overcome. And, and so that's where we see a lot of dropout. But for me, the problem of dropout in grade 10 and 11 is not because of something going wrong in grade 10 and 11. It's largely because of weak learning and teaching in primary school. And so by having an assessment that everyone does once in the year, in primary school, it communicated to parents, to teachers, to learners, to everyone that there's certain outcomes which need to be achieved. Again, a very kind of low level, basic kind of intervention, but for the 80% of schools of ours that are not really functioning well, these are the kinds of interventions that I think drove improvements at a system level. They're very different to the kind of intervention that like a specialist would do by going into one school and doing a whole lot of improvement strategies in one school with a lot of specialization and intensive support to one school. But when you were work, working in 25,000 schools, I think these are the kinds of interventions that may have helped us move the system forward a bit. There's also a lot of research on, on trying to measure the impact of different types of interventions. I just want to highlight two things. One, I think there's a consensus that earlier interventions are better than trying to catch up later on when there's big learning deficits that have already accrued. So improving the quality of early child development opportunities, as well as foundational literacy and numeracy. I think a lot of attention is going there as a more promising place to intervene. And then in terms of types of interventions, one thing which locally and internationally is starting to get some support is helping teachers to better implement the curriculum through things like structured lesson plans, helping them to, to break down the curriculum into daily and weekly schedules and, and plans, offering teachers more meaningful professional support to help them as they do that, those kinds of interventions, and then the materials that integrate and using materials in an integrated way in when implementing the, the curriculum. There's certain programs like it was mentioned earlier, the early grade reading study that we've done where we've evaluated these different interventions and we're starting to see which ones actually objectively have the bigger impacts on learning outcomes. In the last 10 or so minutes, before we do some questions, let me talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic now, having sketched the background, the context of how we're doing as a system. So the background here, as you probably are well aware, is that not only in South Africa, but all around the world, schools were closed in February, March, April last year. In South Africa, it was towards the end of March that schools got closed at the time of the, the, the initial hard lockdown. It made total sense initially. We, one would have initially assumed that COVID would be a bit like flu and other viruses where children spread it a lot at school. 
So schools were closed. We then did a partial, like a phased in reopening from June to August, where certain grades went back before others. And in particular, grade 12 was privileged last year with the matric exams. They didn't lose a lot of teaching days, actually. But some of the other grades, especially the earlier grades, lost a lot of teaching time, a lot of school days last year. And then even once schools were reopened, there's been this practice of rotational timetabling. So in order to allow for social distancing in classrooms, schools had like a situation where only certain grades were attending on certain days. So like if you were in grade three, you might come this week, but not next week, or you might come every second day. And some of the evidence suggests in some schools, it was even less than 50%. It was like you'd come one in four weeks or something like that. So huge amounts of teaching time have been lost in the last year and a half. For some grades, we estimate that 60% of teaching time in 2020 was lost. This year, fewer disruptions, but still rotational timetabling has been going on. Although as from roundabout now, this week and next week, we are moving back to everyday schooling. And I'll give explain more the context to why we, we are doing that. As this pandemic hits education, we obviously wanted to monitor what effect is having and some of the key research monitoring and evaluation questions of these. We've been looking at school attendance rates once, once schools were reopened. We've been looking about how anxious were adults about the children in their households going back to school. We've been looking at, most importantly, I think, the actual health risk of having schools open. We've been looking at how much learning has been lost due to the disruptions. We've been looking at school readiness, so like how, how compliant are schools with all the new protocols of how they have to operate to ensure social distancing, sanitization, etc. And then other costs of school closures like nutrition has been a big cost. So we've been looking at how has the school feeding program been functioning because before the pandemic, that's been a major program that's been rolled out over the last 10 to 20 years, whereby now we provide over 9 million daily meals to children in, in, in our country, which is an enormous provision of food. And that also was disrupted by, by school closures. So we've been looking at these using various data sources from our own readiness monitoring that we've done as the department to information from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases when it comes to infections and hospitalizations and deaths by age group. We've been looking at reading data that we have been collecting over time through the early grade reading study to measure learning losses. Then the NIDS CRAM survey you may have heard of, this was a, a nationally representative household survey where we went back to the same households five times throughout the pandemic from April last year through to May this year. And we've been asking a lot of questions of households, in particular questions around education. So this shows you some of the, the school readiness monitoring we've done as a department. We've looked at the readiness of facilities, looked at like, do they have water and sanitation available? Are they orientating their learners and teachers to comply with the new protocols? Are they complying with the protocols? Like, are people wearing masks and sanitizing? Is there social, psychosocial support available to people at schools? Is the school feeding program happening properly? How are people do, dealing with the adaptations to the curriculum uh, given the shorter school year? We've looked at personnel because many teachers had comorbidities and were staying at home and that had an impact on the provisioning of personnel at schools. We've also looked at scholar transport. So this has been another program that is, is rolled out to try to help children who live more than five kilometers from the school to provide transport to school. And there also we need to monitor, is it happening in accordance with COVID protocols? This is information from the NITS CRAM survey looking at the percentage of households with children receiving meals at school. So before the pandemic, here's a 2018 measure, we, we know that about 65% of households with children had their children receiving a meal at school. It's a large proportion of households with children where they, where they receive food at school. In July last year, when not all, all grades were reopened, we saw only 25% of households had, had children receiving food at school. So a big drop in the, 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 the coverage of the school feeding program. And we also saw an increase in child hunger as a result of the pandemic. And that is still, even today, not being fully addressed. By November, 
we saw nearly 50% of households now having children receive meals at school. So in November, we, schools were now reopen, all grades were reopened, but there's still some rotational timetabling and still an element of disruption. And so it still hadn't bounced back. And I think indications from this year are also that it's still not at the pre-pandemic levels. We're still not feeding as many children as we used to. So there's been massive disruptions to child nutrition. The health risk of attending schools is where there's been some better news. The good news is that children are firstly less likely to become infected with COVID-19 than adults. But most importantly, children are much less severely affected than adults. Very few children get severely ill if they do get COVID-19. But also the, the, the worry then became, okay, but are children just asymptomatic and they're going to go to school, they're going to pick it up and they're going to take it home without even knowing it. And there doesn't seem to be evidence that that's actually what's happening. They, they don't seem to be responsible for the majority of transmission either. Uh, these findings, by the way, are based mostly on international research, but it's completely consistent with the South African numbers as well. And linked to that, studies have found that school closures were not really an effective part of slowing the spread of COVID-19. And conversely, that school reopenings did not lead to um, outbreaks of the virus around the world and, and locally. Locally, the NICD themselves concluded that there were no consistent changes in incidence trends associated with the timing of opening or closing schools in South Africa. And so the attention turned to teachers because they are older than children, obviously, and therefore are, are somewhat at risk. And I'll, I'll show you some teacher data in a moment, but firstly, just to show just how strongly the impact of COVID-19 as a disease is associated with age. This is just NICD data about numbers of deaths by age group. And as you can see, in the younger age groups, just very, very low numbers of children have died since the start of the pandemic even though this is where the bulk of the population is. So even though there are more five to nine year olds than there are 60 to 64 year olds, much more in the country, we see like a far, far greater chance of dying of COVID-19 for older people than for, for children. To put this 26 into context, because you could say, well, even if one child dies of COVID-19, that's one too many. But the reality is that only 26 children are recorded as, you look at say five to nine year olds, are recorded as having died of COVID-19. And this is compared to about 3,000 children in this age group who die every year from other diseases and other causes. So obviously if we have millions of children, some are going to die, but COVID-19 is, is just not one of the big reasons why children are dying. So children at very, very low risk. All right. If we look at teachers, though, one of the ways we've looked at this is by an, an excess deaths approach. So we've got data, daily data, on the numbers of teachers that die every day. Uh, you might be interested to know that, in general, this purple uh, line shows pre-pandemic trends across, across 2019. In general, somewhere around four or five teachers, between three to five teachers sort of die every day in the country. And this is because we have about over 400,000 teachers. So that's just what you'd expect given the, the age profile. What you can see then the green line shows the, the 2020 and going into 2021 trend at the same times of year. And what's very obvious is that there were a lot of teacher excess deaths during the first wave in July last year. And again, during the second wave in January, February of this year. And it's also interesting to note that schools were largely closed during the first wave and during the second wave. So schools closed at the start of December last year, and then they reopened, I think, in February this year. So the point here is that teachers are not really dying much more than normal at many of the times when schools are open, like this whole phase in between the first and second wave, schools were largely open. Same applied to sort of March, April, May. Schools were open, but teachers were not dying more than usual, suggesting that attending school is not the thing that's leading to excess deaths amongst teachers, but the, the spread of the virus in, in the society as a whole is the thing. So even if they're not at school, they are still exposed to the first wave. Even if they weren't in school in December, January, they were still exposed. They were still part of the overall South African population where we did see this pattern of the second wave. It's also worth noting that teachers have now vaccinated the majority of teachers, 
so hopefully we won't see too many excess deaths going forward. What has been the impact on learning? Well, there's been a very substantial negative impact on learning. We've actually now measured things like oral reading fluency across time. So we've compared the gains that, for instance, this graph here, for instance, shows the, the amount of improved reading fluency that typically happens during grade four on average and compared it to the amount that happened in 2020. And we see substantially less learning happen in terms of objective reading outcomes like words correctly read per minute or letter sounds that children can recognize correct per minutes in the case of grade two. So according to various large sample surveys in Pumalanga and Eastern Cape that we've been doing, we're estimating that in at least in home language reading outcomes, about three quarters of a year's worth of learning was lost in 2020. So compared to the amount of that children normally improve and learn in, in reading outcomes over a year, children only learned about 25% of what they normally learn. So we can measure objectively very large losses in learning outcomes. And in the short run, the concern was about, say, the matric class of 2020, who actually did relatively well despite the pandemic. There's concern about dropout in the short run, but the longer term impacts are really what we need to worry about. It's these losses of learning that, that children in the early grades have had, what impact will that have on dropout when they're in grade 10, 11, and 12, and on lifelong outcomes. These are just a couple of links. And if you want to read more about the impact of COVID-19 on schooling, these are some useful links. And so to conclude, I hope you have made the case but that I think education in South Africa has improved on pretty much all indicators, access, quality, equity, redress, inclusivity. But I think that if we're going to continue to improve educational outcomes, which is really important for economic development, we require improved early learning outcomes. That's like the big priority. Pandemic, unfortunately, has set us back in this regard. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back onto an improving trajectory that we were on. But it remains a very long term project because we're trying to change classroom practice on a large scale. And that is quite a different challenge to to what it might be improving your own school if you if you're or your own teaching if you're a teacher but it's really important for our overall economic development thanks very much thank you Stephen. thank you so much such a complex complex matter that you have clarified so brilliantly for us now you know most of us were at school a very long time ago i'm sure there are lots of questions Stephen, may I ask a question? Are the matric exams still at the same standard that we would expect? Or is it being lowered to pass more children? Okay, great. Yeah, let me quickly address that. I'd meant to speak a bit about the 30% pass rate issue. So I would say there's no, I'm not aware of any study or evidence to say that they are of a lower standard. I know that we regularly do benchmarking exercises relative to other secondary school leaving exams. Uh, I know in Scotland and I think Canada. Um, and those, those reviews that get done for us are not suggesting that the standards are just dropping. Also, the 30% pass mark thing is a bit of a myth. So it's not as if 31% uh, on all your subjects is going to get you metric pass. Uh, pass is, is a formula that's it's based on you need a certain number of subjects with 40%. And then if you get that, then you need a certain number of subjects with 30% still. So it's not as simple as 30% as passes or 30% on aggregate passes you. And also, it's also a myth that it was something higher in the past. I don't, I don't believe it. Ms. Naaman might know better here. But, um, no, the, but the past used to be 33 and a third percent. How different is that from 30 exactly the same thing that you know people who crawl over and and get what most people call a matric pass which strictly speaking should be university entrance but just to get a school leaving certificate the, the the similar figure used to be 33 and a third all these clever people watching don't know that because they were never in danger that's right and we still have a thing called bachelor pass so just a matric pass or a national senior certificate pass is not enough to enter university. There's a different, a different type of pass, which is a bachelor pass, which has its own criteria. 
which are more uh, more strict. So, so it's a bit of a myth. And I even think, Stanley, you might know, but I even think in the past there was such a thing as a standard grade pass for a subject, and even a lower grade pass at one. Point. Yes. Which, which there I was an ordinary was. grade, a higher grade, and a lower grade, and yeah. um, you had to make sure that that child got a total of thirty three and a third plus other passes to to get pass to the next level. So you see, it's it's not as people think that this thirty percent is what is the new metric yeah. pass. I'd like to ask a question about uh, doing research, Stephen. Uh, I've done a lot of educational research myself in the past. And what is the attitude of SADTU as an organization and individual teachers towards research being conducted in the classroom uh, related to their, their efficiency and their effectiveness? Uh, you mentioned that one, the national assessments, for instance, were, and you used a very nice phrase, not popular uh, with SADTU. But do, do they actually oppose and, and reject the carrying out of research which has a bearing on finding out whether they're doing their job properly or not? Yeah, they, they wouldn't say it in those terms. They would oppose research. They would probably officially say we'd welcome research to show how we improve. But, but I do think there is a somewhat of a defensiveness in research that, that maybe exposes teachers. I think they'd be concerned of, about that sort of thing. I think that they they do subscribe to sort of ideologies that don't like ass like assessment in general, especially sort of standardized assessments and summative assessments. They may be okay with obviously teachers using assessment formatively within their own classrooms, but I think they would see it as fitting into a, a neoliberal agenda uh, where it's all about measuring certain things and enforcing accountability. And um, so so yeah, I I don't think that to us are making life easy for implementing a lot of the research, especially certain types of reforms that might be proposed, like more accountability-based reforms or, or introducing things like standardized assessments, or even just gaining access to classrooms to measure and observe what's happening. Thank you. Mark van I want to ask you a question. Dion Filmer, he works for the World Bank, he is in charge of the education of, of African children, all of Africa. The last 15 years, about 180 countries which are rated. We used to be around 160. 20 years later, we are about three below the, the lowest, 180. Both our numeracy and our literacy have gone down. We were 20 countries below what we were in, in, in 1935. So what is the explanation? So, you know, this country has over uh, 20 uh, five or 27,000 engineers. A normally developed country like South Africa is calculated in Europe and elsewhere that you need about one engineer for 50 inhabitants of the, of the developed country. You can imagine with, with our 60 million and, and our 28,000, we are about 50 times below what uh, an, an, an equally developed country as South Africa needs. Have you got, have you got a comment on that? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually know Dion Fulmer uh, myself. Yes, he visited in Stellenbosch at least once. Um, I've seen him there and in Washington, D.C. And he does very really good work. So I, I'd want to see that study to kind of actually understand the methodology of how they got to those rankings. And especially, especially if it goes quite far into the past, because... Mm -hmm aware of seeing those sorts of rankings than sort of for than more than about 15 years ago i i'm sure i can find that study as well online uh, but i suspect what's happened in that study is it's it's like a way of, of kind of putting together studies like tim's that i've referred to and other similar ones that have been done around the world and kind of coming up with like an estimate of rankings of countries the problem with a lot of the studies is that it excludes like most of african countries so it ends up looking as if we're just about at the bottom of the world, but, but we're more like at almost at the bottom of those who have participated. But on those same studies, like Tim's being the, probably the main one that he would draw on, our actual levels have been improving over time. So even though our relative ranking is still right near the bottom, the level is improving. So even though it's at a very low level compared to most of Europe, North, North, North America, and East Asia, relative to ourselves, we are improving somewhat.
that's the first thing. And in terms of numbers of engineers, I'm not sure the numbers of engineers, I haven't looked at that data, but I do know that the number of maths, so, so the sort of what we are giving to universities is increasing, whether you look at maths passes at, at 50% or the numbers with 60% or more with maths or the numbers with 70% or more for maths. Those I don't know, no country without engineers can, can keep up. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. I think we've got to, this, that is an important debate. I think Stephen has answered it as well as he can. Uh, Stephen, we've got to let you go. Thank you very, very much. It's really wonderful that you were able to slot us into your busy program. I really appreciate it and good luck for the important, important work you do. Thank you, Stephen.